Welcome to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. I was lucky enough to move to Germany and covered 37 countries from Frankfurt, uh, the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt as our office, and then covered basically from Switzerland and east to the, what was then or back then the old Soviet Union. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. That clip was from Bill Cotter, special agent in charge in the criminal investigations area of the Internal Revenue Service. I think you're going to find this episode both very interesting and very informative and maybe even a little surprising, as you can tell from that clip. I don't know about you, but I have to admit that I was a little ignorant of exactly what some of the positions at the IRS entail. And the picture that Bill describes is definitely entirely different than the quote-unquote desk job that basically I had envisioned. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. And afterwards, you may want to go ahead and check out our home website at www.whereaccountantsco.com. That's whereaccountantsco.com, where we have all our episodes housed, including a forensic accounting series that we did a couple months ago. If you enjoy this one, you're definitely going to enjoy those as well. Let's go ahead and get started. Here's Bill Cotter from the Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigations Division. Well, good morning, Bill. I really appreciate you joining us for the podcast today. This is going to be really unique. We haven't yet had a guest from the Internal Revenue Service come on to talk about career options that are available for us accountants. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. There are some great and unique opportunities for for folks to to use their accounting skills and service to the government. And IRS is a great place to work. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. For our audience's sake, I met our guest today, Bill Cotter, at a continuing education meeting where he was a presenter and he was talking about the unfortunate identity theft issues that exist in, in our world today. However, in his presentation, he referred to the fact that he had an accounting background himself, and so I figured he'd be a great guest for us to bring on the show to talk about the career opportunities that exist in the government, but specifically within the IRS. Bill, I definitely want to get your thoughts and advice on that subject and you know careers within the service, but I always like to start at the beginning so our audience can get to know you better and and really understand where you came from. How did you decide to pursue accounting as a career in the first place? Well, I started with at the University of Texas in Austin. As a student back in the early 80s when I was there, Texas was booming. And I initially wanted to, to get a finance degree because there was a lot of building and a lot of things going on in, in all the cities in Dallas. Dallas was starting to boom or was booming. And so that was my initial focus at UT. And my roommate was an accounting major. And as time would go on, his work, I was more interested in kind of his books and what he was doing than the finance work. And I, I don't know, it was just something that that has spoken to me. My my grandfather had been an accountant. My dad was a businessman. So I was kind of drawn to it. And so kind of over time, I kind of get, gladly, looking back on it, gave up on finance because by the time I got out, the, the boom had busted and I had an accounting degree from UT. And so I had some great professors there that, that at the time and were awesome at, at kind of selling accounting and kind of encouraging folks to be accountants. And that's kind of the, the path that I initially took when, when I started was going to UT was a college roommate and some great professors. Okay. Did, did the possible career options sort of enter into that, that thought process well, I, or was it the subject matter primarily? Probably the subject matter. Cause I, I don't know, especially I guess back at least the way I feel being an older person, you know, 
you went to college and you, you got an accounting degree and you maybe didn't know what you wanted to be at the end of things. But, you know, it, everybody would, at that time, the, the, it was the big eight. And so a lot of people were drawn to that. And, you know, kind of talking to people that had done that kind of work, it was just something that it didn't really speak to me. So I was looking for something different. So I guess I was a little bit struggling on what I was going to do with it. So when I got done, you know, I wasn't sure what I was going to do and, and didn't really think about it, but I knew I needed a job after college and knew someone that worked at the IRS and they suggested interviewing for a position to just kind of have a job to, while I was looking for another job, but got in and, you know, my career kind of took off from there. So Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because it, it looked like that was your first job out of college with, with MRS. It, it was. And, and again, it wasn't meant to be because I had plans on doing other things. And the job that the first job that I took was with what was called back then the exam division. Now it's, it's, it's the, the SBSE exam division. But back then, all exam was kind of lumped together. And I had been interviewed and hired by, by two guys that had done a lot of fraud work. And then working with them, my first thought was, well, this just is a paycheck until I find a job that really kind of speaks to me more. But the more I got engaged with it and the more they kind of told me about other jobs in the service, and in particular jobs with criminal investigation, I found my fit in the criminal investigation kind of world. And so that's what I gravitated towards. And, and that's kind of how I got to where I was and interviewed for both positions and had been very lucky in, in kind of getting those, those jobs. Okay. You know, I'm curious, at that time, was it highly competitive to get into the criminal investigations area? It just seems like um, a lot of people would be drawn to the, that. It, it was a thing that was growing in the late 80s. A lot of, a lot of things were going on in, in the United States, and CI was in a hiring phase. And oddly enough, in, in Dallas at that time where I was, the boom had kind of ended and it was more of a bust, so jobs were harder to get. But it was also a job that that also kind of spoke to me. I like jobs that are are kind of changing and challenging and are kind of, I I love puzzles and games. And so I also love studying people. And so that's what kind of drew me to kind of criminal investigation was kind of putting all those things together because that's what it it kind of takes to kind of help you figure out whether a crime has been committed or putting the pieces together to show that. So I was lucky enough to do that. there was openings, but it was very competitive at the time. It's even more competitive now in trying to get the job. Okay. Okay. You know, one of the things that was intriguing to me is it looks like you've had some very interesting geographical moves with the IRS. I mean, New York, Washington, D.C., Germany. Can we walk through some of that? I mean, how did you get those opportunities? Sure. Sure. For 12 years of my career, I was, I was a special agent in work cases, supporting prosecutions, of individuals for for tax criminal tax violations, bank secrecy violations, and, and money laundering violations, and then decided that I needed kind of a bigger challenge and, and kind of looked for a different opportunity and went into management. And I moved to Albany, New York, where I was a, a first-line supervisor, where I had a group of, at the time, I think when I got to Albany, I had about 15 agents that worked for me and loved doing that there. My wife, who was from South Texas, thought it was the coldest place in the world. So when an opportunity to move to Washington came, she was very much for it. And it was kind of ready in, in kind of in my career to, to move on and move up into what's called a senior analyst position where you deal with different different program areas like corporate fraud or our fraud referral program or our forfeiture program in, in our headquarters. And so I went to headquarters and, and worked with that, did some Corporate fraud did uh, some parallel investigation work with, with with kind of setting that up in CI, and then an opportunity came along. Just one day, somebody that I knew who was in our international section came through our office and said, "Hey, if you're anybody's interested in moving to Germany to be the attaché, the position's coming open." And so I went home and approached my wife with the idea of, of moving our family to Germany and. And our kids were in high school, middle school, and, and elementary school at the time. And so, you know, it was, it was a family move. So we made the decision, and I was lucky enough to get that position. There was actually a lot of competition for that position. So I was lucky enough to move to Germany and covered 37 countries from Frankfurt 
the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt as as our office, and then covered basically from Switzerland and east to the what was then or back then the old Soviet Union, not or prior it had previously been the old Soviet Union. So it was a large, large territory, but a lot of work and. You do that. And I did that for, for a couple of years. And then I moved back to headquarters in our financial crime section and became the assistant director and then the, the acting director there in 2009, where we ran the voluntary disclosure program, then moved to San Antonio, where I've been for the last eight years, both as the assistant special agent in charge and then currently the special agent in charge. Okay. Wow. That's an exciting career. A lot, a lot of fun moves. I, I have a couple of questions. Did you say 37 countries? 37 countries, 12 time zones, if you count Russia. Gosh. So not that I went to, to far eastern Russia, but it was, it was there to be covered if I had to cover it. So it was usually dealing with people in the, in the, the capital cities and with their governments and trying to, to exchange evidence or get evidence. And a lot of it is formalized through treaties. Some of it is building relationships to see if if things can be done, and then if so, how. And so you have to, to be pretty good at kind of building relationships and with people that you don't know and you really, really hope they speak English because I don't have nearly the language skills to cover the diverse languages in the 37 countries that, that I covered. So it was it was quite challenging sometimes. I'm curious, do you speak any other languages now? I speak them poorly, but I speak French, German, and Spanish. But when we get going too quick and too high level, I, I take the exit ramp pretty quickly. But I, I speak probably all of them very poorly, but I do understand more than, than I can really kind of communicate. It's just trying to do that. And the languages that I learned first, I've kind of forgotten the most. So my French is probably my worst, uh, which I learned first, and then then Spanish and then German. So... And I know some phrases in Russian only to get around in Russia. So, hmm. Wow. And I'm going to show my ignorance here, but you used the term attache earlier. Is that, is that a title? It's a title. And, and again, there's all sorts of, a lot of the diplomatic world goes back to some sort of French, I don't know, derivations and titles of positions. And you'll hear them every once in a while, like Chargé d'Affaires and different positions like that. And but attaché is one of them, and it's, it's, you know, you're basically attached to the embassy or a consulate in, in my case because because it was in Frankfurt, which is kind of a, a hub for, for traveling out of continental Europe, so as opposed to Berlin where the U.S. embassy is. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have lived in South Texas practically my whole life. So. <laughs> no. Believe me, it was new to me, too, and I didn't know what it gave me or didn't give me, so I, I was very careful with it, but it sounded cool when you, you put it on your business card. So it was kind of fun when I had, had that as a business card. So. <laughs> so I don't think, at least with many people, that when they picture a career with the IRS, that they, they picture all those different positions and moves and the variety you know that you're describing. What... What do you feel has led to you being presented with those opportunities? What's led to that success? Well, I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things where you, where you you kind of master your craft. I mean, without kind of sounding like I'm bragging, I mean, I was good at what I did and hardworking, which I attribute to my mom and dad probably as much as anything because they instilled that into me and then kind of an attention to detail which, you know, probably I learned more in Dr. Welch's accounting class when I was at UT than anywhere else because he used to move the dates around. And, and I always used to get a little bit off on the problems because I always missed that he moved the date around. And so it became something that stuck with me and, and I've carried to. And, and, you know, as something as, as having an accounting degree and being an accountant, you kind of understand how important details become. But when you're trying to prove a, a criminal fraud or a criminal prosecution, those become the, probably the things that either make the case or you, you're not going to make the case. And so that's just something that, that I've just kind of been able to do. And it's also probably something that drew me to the job in the first place was, was that was a requirement. And I'm pretty detail oriented with my work. So that's kind of helped me in my career. So. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm not trying to glamorize 
the bad things in the world, the evil in the world. You've worked in criminal investigation, though, for a while. Are there any more interesting cases that that you could share with us, you know, the basic details, that, just to give us an idea of what you work on? Well, and kind of what we work on is it runs the gamut. Like I said, we're we're basically the, the forensic accountants for the criminal prosecutions for the government. If there's a big case that has a lot of money, you almost always find an IRS special agent working on the case because of that. And so that's lent ourselves, our agents, and, and I've got to spe- kind of talk in the collective we when I do this because because it's not just me, and, and especially now in my current position in management, I get to, to work with folks that are just doing some incredible things on a daily basis and some incredible cases, keeping, you know, making sure that the, the tax system is fair and, and making sure the country is fair and prosecuting some people that, that, that are some really bad people. And so some of the best, the more fun ones that we've done or are interesting, I guess, is a better term in the last couple of years is, is some of the drug cartels, the international drug cartels that, that, that have been in Mexico. And one of the things that, especially following the money, which is what we do, leads you to is, is the top level people in an organization. And I guess that's what is another reason that, that IRS special agents are brought into to prosecutions is a lot of people will be used to do kind of some of the dirty work, but the money usually flows up to the top of the the organizations. And one of the ones is, is what we call it the horse case. It was the Zetas, Los Zetas out of Mexico, the drug cartel. We prosecuted the, the top members of that organization for laundering their funds in the American quarter horses. And we worked with, you know, various groups, including the American quarter horse association and kind of finding out all the horses they had and kind of working with them. And at one point in time, we seized approximately 600 horses which was, I didn't grow up on a farm and I didn't grow up on a horse or having a horse. And so it was, it was challenging just trying to figure out and making decisions on, on, on the care for the horses and how that worked. And typically animals aren't something that, that the government likes to seize because it can be a very difficult thing to do. But we worked through the process and, and we sold them for quite a bit of money and they were very valuable. And we, it's one of those things that allowed us to get to the top of an organization to basically the toys that these these criminals had here in the United States where they had put and laundered their money. And we had be, were able to kind of trace the funds going around from the criminal side through to the purchase of the horses. And it was really kind of a, a very good prosecution of people who had very much insulated themselves against being caught for for kind of the drug side of their what they were trying to do, and so that was probably one of the better ones. And and we've also been involved in some joint terrorism matters where people were trying to support going overseas in Austin to commit acts of terror overseas, and and that's probably another place where we do. And it's those people that may may have learned some some techniques overseas in fighting coming back that become the scarier part of, of why we really need to do that. And, and working with the FBI and, and the local joint terrorism task forces I mean, supporting that and kind of, again, following the money is, is our part. And, and so that's some of just a, a quick kind of view of a couple of the cases that we've done. Personally, I've, I've worked cases that, that run the gamut from regular tax cases to investment scheme cases where the SEC was involved to to investment fraud schemes, commercial credit frauds, where literally 1,100 companies have been been schemed in a credit scheme, and they took $11 million of goods in about 90 days from these 1,100 companies. And it, it was kind of an interesting case, and an interesting guy it kind of changed some of the ways commercial credit's given out by the folks who do, do give out commercial credit scores. So that was kind of a good case that actually had impact beyond just the criminal case that it had, it showed some weaknesses in that system that those criminals were able to exploit. How dangerous is your job? It's one of those things. I mean, you never know how people react and Mm -hmm. probably increasingly so people's behavior is becoming erratic and and aggressive, but it's one of those things. It's one of those things. We we ensure that we go out in, in pairs when we do interviews we train our folks, and it's one of the things that, that if you want to become a special agent, 
you probably need to be physically fit and enjoy things that are physical and be ready to understand that at some point in time, you may have to get yourself out of a tough situation, whether it just be backing out and using your voice and kind of your wits to kind of taking somebody and kind of extricating yourself from from somebody who's kind of grabbed you to, to being ready to use your firearm, which has rarely happened in my career and, and never that I'm aware of against an individual. So that's kind of where it is. Usually what we, the biggest thing we see is doing search warrants in drug cases or our dogs that have been a, been a trained attack. And that's kind of the, one of the biggest threats that we see is, is that unfortunately people using dogs as weapons and, and they're, they can be very formidable and, and it's very tough to deal with. Yes. I was just, I was listening to, you know, the seizure of the horses with the, the money laundering and, and counterterrorism. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, this isn't just a desk job. <laughs> you're, you're out and, there. And, the Go ahead. No, it's not a, just a desk job. I mean, a lot of what we do, I mean, it's one of those things, if you looked at part of our days, it would be incredibly boring. But then there are days where you're going, okay, that's kind of off the charts, really on the other end of boring. So it runs in, the, there's a balance. But it's probably if you if you asked everybody who was employed here, it's what keeps people here is that kind of balance being using your accounting skills, because that's what we are is, is we're accountants and we follow money to be able to prove either people used it or got it or didn't report it in tax cases. And that's the part of it. And that's kind of the green visor to accountant kind of sitting there, very detail oriented work to put a prosecution together that can can withstand some very, very good defense attorneys who are very good at at finding the smallest of holes in your cases and kind of pointing that out to kind of doing search warrants and doing seizures and that kind of work, which is part of it. But again, it's also kind of what kind of make the job a really kind of neat and fun job. Okay. Wow. So what qualifications does IRS look for these days to, to get into these fields? Well, and, and, and I'll speak to kind of a, a job with criminal investigation as a special agent. The, the, other, the other jobs as a revenue agent, both in our, our large business and international division or, or our small business and small self-employment division, those are pure revenue agents who examine tax returns and have an accounting degree. And then we have our collection division, which, which ensures that money that's owed to the government is, is collected upon. And then there's the folks in criminal investigation. It requires a minimum of 15 hours. And if you probably sat through five accounting classes, you probably got an accounting degree, but we don't require it. We just require the 15 hours of accounting plus nine other business-related credits. So usually it's somebody with at a minimum a business degree or somebody who's gone back with a specific purpose to become a, a special agent to qualify. And we've had folks do that. We've had folks who've had law degrees who come join us, and and we have that just because, again, some of the parts of being a special agent where you do have kind of an action piece to you're not just sitting in an office, you know, doing legal briefs all day long. So we, it runs the gamut. You have to be on board as a special agent by your 37th birthday, and that's because of the, the law enforcement retirement that special agents have and by as a job classification across the government, whether you're an FBI agent, a DEA agent, or an IRS special agent, you all have the same same type of retirement system and same sort of requirement for having to have a minimum of 20 years of service. And you also have, there's a mandatory that you have to retire the month of your 57th birthday. So by that, you need to, to be on board or you have, there's a couple of ways around it. If you have prior military service on by your 37th birthday, but most of the folks that we get usually have figured out they want to be here by then. And so that's kind of it. And then the last part of it is is a medical screen that you have to be able to pass, just some fitness and, and some other hearing eyesight related requirements that, that you need to, to go through to, to become a special agent. Okay. Wow. And I'm sorry, you said criminal investigations. There's, there's a revenue agent, special agent. Were there other positions where I missed? There was a, there's, we also have revenue officers too that will ensure that, that they collect or collecting the tax that's owed the U.S. The US Treasury. So there's those main three positions. We also have a lot of people who are in the cyber world, cybersecurity, cyber world, because getting a tax return in and getting the funds paid, there's 
it's amazing how big of a process that is because the amount of inflow of information and the amount of inflow of money and outflow of money during during any either calendar year or fiscal year it's in the it's probably over into the trillions and so it's it's billions of money flowing in and out during the filing season but over the course of the year it's it's the i think it's 90% of the US government's budget flows in through the IRS Ooh. okay well i end every podcast with the same three questions for all our guests but before we get to that one one more along these lines i guess over over the years if you think back to when you got into the IRS, what has surprised you the most? I guess it's the point that I was just talking about is, is everybody, you know, I think that the people that, that may listen to this or the public used to be you, you just mailed in your tax return back when it was, a, it was a paper form. Now you just either take it to somebody or you just shoot it off into cyberspace. And you just figure, well, that's that's pretty simple. And it's it's amazing how complicated it gets in getting everybody's money credited to them, all the money in the right place, all the money flowing in and out of the treasury in a year that passes through the Internal Revenue Service. It's stunning how complicated that process gets. And I don't I think people think, oh no, it just happens. And there's thousands of people that are dedicated from cybersecurity people that, that ensure that their information is safe because there's people who try to, from around the globe, try to attack the, the IRS systems on a daily basis. And so, you know, we have a lot of really talented folks that do a lot of different things. So it's pretty, pretty incredible because the amount of people who are, who are either revenue agents, revenue officers, or special agents is actually a smaller part of the IRS than the bigger part where it's getting the kind of everybody's account credited and all the money flowing in and out as it should in kind of a really timely fashion. And that's kind of the surprising part. And when you go into a service center and kind of see what gets done and understand what some people's jobs are, it's, it's pretty stunning how, how that comes off pretty smoothly every year. Mm. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah, a lot of people just take that part for granted. <laughs> a lot of moving parts. <laughs> Well, like I mentioned, I end every podcast with the same three questions, and so I wanted to do the same here. Number one, what's been your proudest moment in your career? I've got a couple of them. One's kind of a people-related one, and one's kind of a business-related one. And the people was one was in 2010, February of 2010, there was an attack on the IRS building in Austin where we had employees, and, and I was at the time the leader of our field office, and we were one of the very impacted sites. We had an individual who was a task force officer with us who was very, very badly burned and kind of working with our people and making sure that they came through that event the best that, that you could be and getting them back to work and making sure that that they were okay, both from an emotional standpoint and from a physical standpoint. That's probably one of my proudest because for six weeks, I probably worked almost nonstop every day going from San Antonio to Austin and then ensuring that our folks were okay and that, that things were going better. And I'm, I'm really incredibly proud of, of leading our office through what then was a very difficult time. And it was, you know, kind of a, the resiliency of the people and kind of some help and support, but also understanding that, that business resumption had to occur. And working through that process with our folks who were, who were pretty tremendous on getting that done. And we were, we were, could have been up and running probably within three days only because we had to get a new server sent to us because our, our other one was, was filled with dust and soot from, from the fire from the plane. But that's probably one of my proudest just from a people standpoint. And because I think the people that were here and that I work with came out pretty well on the back end of that. And I'm pretty proud of that. From a business side, it would probably be the 2009 Voluntary Disclosure Program, where the IRS in 2009 put together the kind of their first big initiative in a number of years going after folks who were offshore. And in the time that I ran the Financial Crimes Unit, where that kind of the was the heart of kind of that whole operation, we developed the, the form. We had started out with interviews that were two to three hours long and that were very time consuming and very difficult. And it wasn't going to move a lot of people through the process to, to moving it through to a form that people could submit that allowed 
tax professionals and taxpayers to do it much more efficiently. It caused a lot of strain on on employees that in CI who had to kind of review it. But in in the end of that first voluntary disclosure program, 15,000 taxpayers came on board. And I think the taxes that were brought in were somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 billion. And so I'm pretty proud of leading the group of folks that, that did that. It was a really big team effort in our headquarters section and across criminal investigation and across the service. And the part that we played in in our section kind of coming up with the form was pretty neat and I think a great business accomplishment. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, career-wise or, you know, over, over your whole career, tell us about a mistake you've made. Thinking back and what you learned from it, and and frankly, the bigger the better. <laughs> he, well, I, I'm talking with someone before doing this, and, and and he kind of brought up the fact that if I'd made too big a mistake, I probably wouldn't be the person talking to you today. So, um, <laughs> and not that I haven't made any mistakes, but believe me, I I was trying to think of okay, a colossal mistake, and I was thinking oh, a colossal mistake, and you're probably not talking to me. But it, it's just kind of funny stories of of different things that that have gone through and. You know, it's it's just being prepared, and part of it was having a job that where there was a lot of international travel. I learned some kind of hard lessons and made some colossal mistakes and kind of some rookie mistakes traveling internationally of using my iPod and, and having my headphones in. And in a couple of instances where it where it cost me quite dearly, one was on a train in the Netherlands, and the train came to a stop at a at a train station, and everybody on the train got off. And I was playing my music. I was doing something else. And, and, and I looked up and everybody's getting off the train. And I knew we weren't our final destination. And so I was in a panic looking for a person who spoke English to kind of let me know what had happened and what my choices were. on Because people went in two groups in two different directions. And so I was kind of perplexed by that. And, and it happened to me again one time when I was flying out of Kiev. And and I was sitting there and I was watching a movie and I had a bad habit of not changing my watch to local time and keeping it on the time where I was living in Frankfurt. And so I kept looking at my watch and sure enough, I had enough time. Well, by the time I figured out I didn't, I went to the gate. And my plane had already left and the Ukrainian officials would, had scoured the airport looking for me. But I was sitting there with my my headphones in and, and at their airport, you didn't sit at the gate where you were flying out of. You sat kind of across the airport and then you went to a gate, and then you just kind of lined up and went out the door. So it was kind of different. So so both of those have kind of taught me to be very careful as an international travel, especially when you don't speak that language. And that was probably as, as colossal a mistake as, as I can really remember. There's there's one about not getting a tire repaired and not having a spare that, that almost became kind of kind of a really bad story. But those would be, be kind of some of the biggest that I made. And it's, I guess, in some of it is just we have to be careful because we do work for the IRS. It's a very sensitive job. So we try not to make colossal mistakes. And then, you know, hopefully that knock on wood, I can keep that going until the end of my career. <laughs> no more earbuds for you. There you go. <laughs> well, last question, and then we'll close it down and say goodbye. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? And I can remember why I was newer and and I had a boss and he, he said, this too shall change. And I can remember, you know, every time he said it, he used to kind of cringe because change, you know, I was young and, and kind of wasn't really too thrilled on change. And, you know, he, he always had another saying that the, the pendulum swings and it may be bad right now, but things will change. And, and I always kind of hated, hated whenever he said that. And now I find myself telling the people I work with, there's nothing constant but change. And, and it is true, whether it's, it's budget pieces that come out of Washington or new technology that we have to adapt to and learn or new methods to either evade your taxes or, or launder money that, that you got to catch up with. There's in the, really in this job, there's nothing constant but change. And it's probably could be said in almost every job, but it, it's very true with ours and in, in how we what we deal with. You got to stay up on emerging issues. You got to be willing to learn new things as they come along, new technologies. So that would be kind of my thing. Is the best piece of advice I got is, is there's nothing constant but change or the pendulum swings. And it's good, bad, and indifferent. But there's a lot of really good in it, and especially it kind of keeps life fun and, and makes things challenging. Hmm. That is good advice. It, it's good when you can work with somebody that's a little more experienced and consequently wiser and more patient. <laughs> uh, 
that is that is a blessing. Wonderful. Well, thank yeah. you so much. I, I really appreciate how how open and and just realistic you've been about the job. I, I think this is really going to be good for our listeners. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time out for this, Bill. Well, thank you for having me. No problem. Have a great week. We'll talk to you again. You too. Like I said in the intro, that interview ended up being much different than I had originally envisioned. I assumed there were going to be some relocation opportunities available within the Internal Revenue Service, but it totally never occurred to me that something overseas may actually be an option. Plus, the investigations that you can get involved with involve so much more than simply finding cheating on a tax return. The, the involvement with counterterrorism work and the seizing of assets, the, the quarter horse seizure that he was mentioning was something that I guess I, I just hadn't even considered being a part of a position at the IRS. Very, very fascinating. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Please visit us online as well at www.whereaccountantsgo.com for the full show notes, as well as links to all the other 40 plus episodes dating back to last October. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you so much for joining us. See you soon. There's more to come.